Welcome back to Study in Australia TV. I'm Casey, and today in this episode we're going to be discussing Australian reptiles. Before we begin, let's talk about what a reptile is, and what kind of defining features they share. Well, they're ectothermic, meaning that they're unable to maintain a constant internal body temperature by themselves. They must instead rely on external heat sources, for example sunlight, hot rocks or concrete, to keep them warm. Which is why you'll often see them sunbaking. Ectotherms are often referred to as cold-blooded, but this technically isn't true. Their blood isn't cold. It just keeps warm in a different way. Another major characteristic of reptiles is that their skin is covered in scales. The scales are hard plates used for protection, which grow out of their skin. They are made of a protein called creatine, which is also a key structure in materials such as hair, nails, and feathers. But of course, reptiles aren't the only animals with scales. They're also found in fish, some mammals, and even the feet of birds. Let's start things off with lizards. I bet you've never seen one quite like this. This is the frilled neck lizard. They're also known as a frilled lizard or a frilled dragon. This carnivorous reptile can live up to 20 years and grow to 85 centimeters. They are found across Northern Australia and Southern New Guinea and spend most of their time camouflaged on tree trunks, branches, coming down only to feed or mate. Their name comes from the colorful skin flap encircling their head, which can be yellow, orange, or red, depending on the distribution. When threatened, they extend their frill, giving the illusion that they are much larger than they are, hopefully scaring off their enemies. But if this fails, they'll simply sprint away. Defense isn't the only thing the frill is used for. It can also be used for communication, finding a mate, and when sunbathing, they'll extend it in order to absorb greater amounts of heat. So it's used for thermal regulation, remembering they are ectotherms. They mainly feed on insects, meaning they're primarily insectivores, but they're also known to eat spiders, mice, and other lizards. Once the females lay their eggs, the sex of the offspring is known as hatchlings, is determined by the temperature. Warmer temperatures mean more males while cooler means more females. The blue tongue lizard. This unique lizard can be found in most habitats across much of Eastern and Northern Australia. Like the frill lizard, they rely on the sun for their thermoregulation. As the name would suggest, Eastern blue tongue lizards possess a vivid blue tongue, which they use for a defense tool to scare off predators. When threatened, they'll open their mouth and hiss. The bright blue is stark contrasting to the rest of their pink mouth. They have grey or brown bodies with darker bands running along their torso and tails and are much lighter on their bellies. They have a wide triangular head and can grow up to 60 centimetres. They hunt for their prey, mainly insects and snails, using a specific organ on the roof of their mouth known as a Jacobson's organ. This is used for sensing chemicals emitted by their prey. They are omnivorous and also eat vegetation and berries. Female lizards do not lay eggs. Instead, they produce live young. They give birth to 10 young in a litter and are self-sufficient at birth. Let's move on to another animal, the turtles. I'll start by clarifying the difference between a turtle and a tortoise. While both are hard-shelled, tortoises are adapted for life on land, while turtles are adapted to life in the water. Tortoises have a more rounded dome-shaped shell, while turtles have a flatter, more streamlined shell for swimming in the water. Tortoises have a thick black legs, uh, legs and feet to support their weight on land, while turtles have flippers and webbed feet for swimming through the water. We'll concentrate on turtles, as there aren't any endemic tortoises in Australia. We'll start with a freshwater species, the Murray River Turtle. They also go by the names Murray Shortneck Turtle or the Macquarie Turtle. Their shells are medium to dark brown on top and yellow cream colored underneath. They have dark gray skin with a yellowish stripe running from their mouth down their necks. They have small round yellow eyes. If you'd like to tell the difference between males and females, the males have a much wider and longer tail than the females and fully grown males are often larger than females. They are widely spread species found in rivers throughout Eastern Australia. Unlike their aforementioned reptile relatives, the gender of Murray River turtles is not determined by heat during incubation, but by the same means as human sex determination, 
the XY sex determination system. They are one of the few turtles with this system. On average, they grow to about 30 centimeters in length. Compared to other freshwater Australian turtles, their necks are quite short, hence the name. They're omnivorous, with diets including water plants, algae, crustaceans, and mollusks like snails. Of course, turtles do not only live in freshwater. There are seven species of saltwater turtles, six of which are found in Australian waters. Now, let's look at one of them more closely, the green sea turtle. You might look at these beautiful creatures and say, wait, but they're not green. Well, actually, their name comes from the color of their fat tissue. This color is a result of their diet, which consists of mainly sea grasses and algae. They are the only species of turtle that eat large amounts of these plants as adults. Although the adults are herbivorous, vegetarians, juveniles will also eat invertebrates, sponges and jellyfish. Green sea turtles can live to over 50 years, grow to over 150 centimetres in length and weigh over 300 kilo. Like the Murray River turtle, the males are typically larger than the females, with large tails. They mate every two to four years, and when it comes time to lay their eggs, the females will climb out of the water and onto land. This is usually a sandy beach, and often the same beach where they hatched. They use their flippers to dig a hole in which they lay 100 to 200 eggs. Then they fill the hole back in and return to the ocean. After about two months, the eggs hatch to face the most dangerous challenge of their lives, this first journey to the ocean. There are many predators who wait to feed on these little hatchlings as they attempt to make it to the water. Like many of the reptiles, we've spoken about the gender of the hatchlings is determined by temperature during incubation. In warmer temperatures, around 31 degrees, most of the hatchlings will be female, while cooler temperatures, around 28 degrees, they'll be mainly male. Green sea turtle populations are widespread around the planet and lay their eggs across the coastline of over 80 countries. Australia is lucky enough to host one of the largest nesting populations. Something really cool about them is that they use their magnetic field of the earth to navigate. Essentially, it's like a magnetic mineral in their brain called magnetite, which helps them navigate in an, like an internal GPS. Unfortunately, they are classified as an endangered species. This is due to a number of reasons, including being hunted for their meat, becoming caught in nets and drowning, and destruction of their nesting sites. In fact, all seven species of sea turtle are threatened with extinction. Being classified either as vulnerable, endangered, or critically endangered. Snakes. A lot of people from overseas refuse to visit Australia because of the snakes. But they aren't as scary as everyone thinks. A lot of the fear surrounding these Aussie animals comes from the lack of understanding. There are over 3,000 species of snakes in the world, and of that, only 173 call Australia home. Contrary to popular belief, most snakes are naturally not aggressive animals. They prefer to retreat than attack, and they'll generally only attack humans if they feel hurt or provoked. Unfortunately, many snake populations are in decline, due to the habitat destruction from bushfires or land clearings, introduced predators such as foxes, dogs and cats, being run over by cars or simply being killed on the spot by humans. It is very unlikely that you will be bitten by a snake. Lightning strikes, dog attacks and peanut allergies attribute to more human deaths in Australia per year than snake bites. I'm going to introduce you to a couple of our local snakes so that you can learn to understand them a bit better. Eastern and Western brown snakes these snakes can be found throughout much of the mainland of Australia, but if you're staying in Tasmania, you won't spot any. As the name suggests, they are generally brown in colour, but this brown varies from light to dark or even orange brown. The eastern can grow to around 2 metres and the western is around 1.8 metres. Before we continue, let's define venom. Do you know the difference between venomous and poisonous? Venom is a mixture of toxins which are delivered, usually through a sting or a bite from one organism to another. Essentially, it is a specialized form of poison that is actively delivered. The difference is where other poisons may be eaten or passed through the skin, venom is delivered with a specialized evolutionary tool. For example, the fangs of a snake or the stinger of a bee. The Eastern Brown is typically very aggressive. Their fangs are actually quite small compared to other Australian snakes. 
They're the second on the list of most venomous terrestrial snakes. Terrestrial meaning that they live on land. But don't get too worried just yet. To put it into perspective, there were 19 human deaths caused by snake bites between 2005 and 2015, and 15 of those were caused by eastern brown snakes. Generally, only one to four deaths per year in Australia can be attributed to snake bites. The western brown snake was once believed to be a single species, but has since been recognised as a group of at least three closely related species. They are less aggressive than their eastern counterparts, and vary greatly in pattern and colour. They would typically flee from humans, but will defend themselves if they feel that they are being under threat. Like the eastern brown, the venom of the western is very potent. Even for those very few people unlucky enough to be bitten, antivenom is available. Brown snake antivenom can be used for both species, and has been available since 1956. Antivenom acts to neutralise the effects of the venom. Not everyone who gets bitten by a snake need, necessarily needs antivenom, however a bite from any brown snake should be assumed as life-threatening, and should be treated as such. Seek medical attention immediately and call an ambulance. Inland Taipan Snake So, if Eastern Brown Snake holds the title for second most venomous terrestrial snake, what's the first? I'd like to introduce you to the Inland Taipan Snake, also known as the Fierce Snake. They've got quite a reputation, and fair enough, as they are the most venomous snake in the world. They grew to an average length of 2 metres, with the largest length recorded as 2.5 metres. Their colour changes with the season, dark in the winter months and light in the summer. They were first discovered in 1879, and again spotted in 1882, before seeming to disappear for 90 years until they were rediscovered in 1972. Luckily, they have a fairly small distribution and are only found in southwest Queensland and northeast South Australia, around the borders of the two states. They once had populations in New South Wales and Victoria, but are now presumed to be extinct in these areas. As they spend most of their time in cracks and burrows below the surface and because of the remoteness of their habitat, they are rarely seen by humans in the wild. They are generally very placid and shy species, but will defend themselves if they feel threatened. One study found only 4% of snake bite patients were administered Taipan antivenom. So again, your chances of running into one are quite slim. Crocodiles. Australia is home to two species of crocodiles, the freshwater crocodile and the saltwater crocodile. Although the freshwater croc is only found in Australia and the saltwater is also found in other countries, such as India, New Guinea and Malaysia. Let's start with the freshwater. Males can grow up to three meters long, while females are considerably smaller, getting to a maximum of two meters. Their diet consists of smaller river animals such as turtles, fish, frogs, birds, as well as other animals that come to drink from the water. They do not eat people, so don't worry. They generally only attack humans if provoked. Just like the frill neck lizard, and many other reptiles, the gender of the young is determined by incubation temperature. Saltwater crocodiles. If you thought the freshwater crocodiles were big, you've got another thing coming. Saltwater males can grow up to seven meters, and females are up to four meters, and they can weigh 1,000 kilo. They are the Earth's largest extant crocodile. Remember, extant means not extinct. Due to their large size, they're able to prey on larger animals and are known to eat cows and pigs when they come to drink from the water as well, as wallabies and even other crocodiles. No one is sure how long they have lived, but they know they can live up to 50 years in captivity. They are opportunistic predators, meaning that they will wait patiently under the water for their prey to come to drink. They leap from the water, grasping their prey and drag it back into the water, keeping it under until it drowns. They will eat almost anything that they can catch. They can stay submerged underwater for over an hour. Don't worry too much, they're only found in Northern Australia. And even if you are there, just make sure to be safe. Follow the rules, don't swim in any unfamiliar waters without knowing it's safe first. So how can you tell the difference? Aside from the size, there are a couple of ways to distinguish between the two species. First is the shape of their teeth and heads. Saltwater crocodiles have broader snouts than the freshwater crocodiles. They also have uneven teeth. Some teeth are twice the size of the others, 
whereas the freshwater crocodiles have teeth that are almost equal in size. This brings us to the end of the episode. I hope you enjoyed getting to know some of our scalia Aussie wildlife. You probably won't encounter them in the wild, but I do encourage you to head to the zoo to meet them in person. If you are interested in Australian wildlife and interested in studying it, then study in Australia TV can help. Get in contact and we'll see what we can do. Thanks for tuning in and until next time.